Yes, uh, hello everybody. I welcome you to my lecture on art as uh, representation. Uh, before we start, just some words about organization. Uh, you know that you have to be registered uh, to, to the base to get all the information and, for instance, all the PowerPoints after every lesson. And all the students who are not from this university have to be inscribed, otherwise you, this is not possible. And also, of course, if you want to make the exam at the end of the semester, you have to be inscribed, okay? And then we, we always meet actually Wednesday at this time, but uh, uh, next week and, and in two weeks, uh, we, we have holidays, so we will see each other only in three weeks again. Um, have you any questions about the, the lecture, or can we start? Okay, I held this um, lecture uh, 2018 in German under the title Kunstgeschichte als Kulturwissenschaft. And as such, it is on YouTube. You can hear and listen it in German on um, YouTube. It was now translated uh, to English by Jean Brian. And afterwards, it will be put on YouTube too. That's why Simeon Yax is here, and he makes a video about it. Um, it is odd that there exists no adequate uh, English uh, equivalent of the German term Kulturwissenschaft to convey what is meant by the term I prefer to use, in our present context, the word representation. And I do so in line with the theoretical concept put forth by Stuart Hall in his book on representation. I want, today, I want to say some words about what I mean with this concept. But I do not intend, however, to give an hour's lecture on theory. Rather, now and in the course of this semester, on the basis of concrete examples, I propose to show what is meant by art history oriented towards a concept of representation. I must nevertheless say at the outset that Kulturwissenschaft builds on a complex theoretical foundation, and it is not to be confused with cultural history nor with cultural studies. And uh, following this introduction, I will give you a synoptic view on the topics we'll be covering this semester. And then we will start with our really first lecture. <clears throat> As different from one another as the various approaches to Kulturwissenschaft may be, it can nevertheless be said, in my opinion, that what we refer to as the cultural turn and the linguistic turn are paradigmatic. That is, both notions are based on the premise that everything that is produced by human beings is to be seen as precisely that, namely as having been produced by human beings. In other words, it's to be seen as a culture, as culture and not as something that is simply given by nature or as an ahistorical truth. This may at first sound like a platitude, but it is in fact a radical standpoint. Radical because what is meant by everything that is produced by human beings is not only products of a material nature, but also systems of thought, and system of organizing knowledge, as well as religions and social practices. Disciplines that concern themselves with the study of culture in the sense of representation inquire into the ways in which the meanings of these social practices are constituted. 
they look into what these practices actually signify. In this process of inquiry, the assumption is that meaning or signification does not lie in the things themselves, but is rather something that is always produced, communicated and altered. We have no direct, genuine access to the real. Objects, events, even things we experience and feel all inquire meaning only through the ways in which we interpret and deal with them. When I use the term representation, I do so in the semiotic sense. By representation, I do not mean mimesis. Here again, I might refer to uh, Stuart Hall. There is no such a thing as a genuine form of visual representation of reality that is not conveyed through some kind of medium. The various media of representation are multifarious. They include not only language, but also images, gestures, mimicry, material objects, which in exemplary fashion are loaded with meaning and used in a specific ritual context thus creating signification as it were. They are clothing to which a sign character is attributed, and so forth. Uh, when people today constantly speak of the age of media, often decry in apocalyptic tones the demise of an alleg allegedly real world that is becoming nothing but simulacra, we should not forget that our perception and understanding of the world has never been free from agency of media of one kind or another. And that the various systems of science were never simply given by nature. Because if they had been, they would never have been science. There is no such thing as thought that has not been preceded by the agency of some kind of medium. In the current discourse, one often hears speak about the pictorial turn, which has supposedly superseded the linguistic turn. To assert that it has implies a supposed separation between image and language. But semiotics is based on the very premise that language and image are intrinsically linked. Language constantly makes reference to images. Think of metaphors. Images constantly make reference to language. Nevertheless, the fact is that today, more than ever before, we find ourselves submerged in a flood of images. Another fact is that semiotics has focused mostly on language and that we are not used to reading images. Art history has developed methods that are perfectly adequate for providing insights in this regard. Methods such as style analysis, structural analysis, iconography, iconology, and so on. So there is no need to reinvent them. I would like to name a few points that I find essential when it comes to approaching any scholarly inquiry as a study of representation. In order to understand artifacts, we must consider them in context. Likewise, in the case of paintings or sculpture, they must be seen in an interpictorial context for example, this is the iconographic tradition, but they must also be seen as embedded in the discourses and social practices of their time. Hence, the interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary nature of disciplines that concern themselves with the study of culture. It is important that we overcome 
the tendency to encapsulate the individual disciplines of the humanities. Furthermore, the disciplines that have as their aim the study of representation are based on an understanding of the notion of culture that is not only of high culture belonging to an elite. Culture is a way in which man in his entirety lives. It encompasses all aspects of human life. Culture is always embedded in social, economic, and political conditions. This implicitly raises a question of power. Who possesses the power of interpretation? Let me give you a simple example of what I mean. The headscarf. In itself, the headscarf is devoid of meaning. It is people who attribute meaning to it. How this headscarf is to be interpreted is a question of who has the power to interpret. But it does not have only one meaning. It can have very different meanings for different people in different cultures. Even today, a Muslim woman can see the headscarf not as a sign of oppression, but quite on the contrary, as a sign of resistance against the power of interpretation that the Western society in which she lives presumes to possess. Nor do notions have only a single so-called natural or inherent meaning. How they are to be understood always depends on how and on who uses them, in what circumstances and how. Take the notion of freedom, for example. We have always to ask, freedom for whom? Freedom from what? Freedom to do what? It's one thing for an oppressed minority to fight for freedom. It's quite another for a party set to represent the interests of the state to see in the notion of freedom, the freedom given to financial capital. So what I just want to say is that one notion can mean very different things. Meaning is not inherent in the things themselves. It is we who load them with meaning. It is always in actual practice that meanings emerge. This also means, however, that meanings can change. A work of art is not identical with the conscious initial intentions of the artist. It is always part of an evolving process of production as well. We ask our question from current perspective. Our situation is different. The way we see things is different. Our theory potential is different. It's foolish to imagine that we can look at the work from the early Middle Ages with the same eyes as those of the people of that time. We can attempt to reconstruct what might possibly have been the reception of the work at that time. But we are also able to recognize certain unquestionably pertinent aspects that were not perceived as such by the people of the time. At this point, I would like to present you the general lecture plan that is the topics with which we shall be concerning ourselves during the course of the semester. As you will see, the topics are of a fundamental nature. They are topics that we usually see as dealing with things that are simply given by nature. We usually treat them as being essentialist. So we will start today with the conceptions of God. And then we will continue with the creation of the world, Adam and Eve, the fall of man and Cain and Abel. And then with the ideas of death the, and the conceptions of the afterlife and the last judgment. 
we will deal with ethical concepts, evil, mortal sins, and virtues. And then very different questions like body and gender constructs, masculinity constructs, emotions, melancholy, nature, landscape, and social utopias. This last one, we uh, probably will not be able uh, to talk about because I didn't realize that we have two holidays now. But now I start with the conceptions of God. We are used to assuming that our own culture, the culture in which we live, is self-evident. Something that is simply a natural given. Particularly in this time of globalization, it makes sense for us to be able to take a look at our own cultural framework and profile, as it were. We are used to perceiving others as foreign and not at all questioning what we take for granted as appertaining to us. We should try to turn things around and ask just what it is that we see as appertaining to us. One of the main basic assumptions to consider here is the conception we have of God. I would like to show you how the Christian conception of God emerged, what its sources were, how it has changed over time, its specific characteristics, and above all, how images, painted or sculptural, have contributed to shaping the ideas we have of God. These images are, of course, not likeness, because God is invisible. Nor are they illustrations of theological texts. Nevertheless, similarly to texts, although in a different way, they have generated conceptions of God. Unfortunately, we haven't got the time to examine in greater detail conceptions of God that exist in other cultures, and especially the premises of the Christian conception of God. Let it suffice to mention, although I'm sure it's a fact of which you are already quite aware, that in prehistoric times there existed numerous deities, male and female, that were connected with the forces of nature. These deities were, without exception, ambivalent, being neither exclusively benevolent nor exclusively malevolent. And they were often conceived of as having an animal form. The fear of the power of the gods was assuaged mostly by means of sacrifice, do ut des, I give you something, so you give me something. Female deities played an eminent role as goddesses of fertility. And as you know, Christianity grew out of Judaism, as it existed in Greco-Roman antiquity. In Judaism, you have already monotheism. And there's a myth on which monotheism is founded. And this is written in the Bible, in the Old Testament. After the exodus from Egypt and crossing of the Red Sea, Moses received from God the tablets of stone on which the Ten Commandments were inscribed. Here, for the first time, it was established in writing that there existed one and only one God. This is Judaism's profession of faith. The sole reign of one God, no more multiplicity, although the dichotomy of benevolence alongside malevolence remains. Indeed, God says of himself, I'm a jealous God. 
He is also a God who punishes a wrathful God. This will change then in Christianity. We will see this in lecture four. But in the Bible is written that fathers should kill their sons and sons their fathers should this commandment not be obeyed and other gods be worshipped. This is stated in the Bible, an incitement to violence against those who have different beliefs, a legitimation and sacralization of violence in the name of God and religion. The consequences of this doctrine persist to this day. Another part of the commandments is the prohibition of images. You are not to produce likeness. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, you read, Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness, or anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. So, no images, but abstraction. But there is a contradiction. Man was created in God's image. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, we read, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Christianity takes up Judaism's prohibition of images having grown out of Judaism and also being against the pagan practice of worshipping idols, but also because it is an underground organization. For the first two to three centuries, you have no images. Imagine three centuries of Christianity without images. Beginning with the end of the third century, the images start. And you have them, uh, especially in frescoes, in the catacombs or in sarcophagi. And you see, what you see is um, the Good Shepherd, meaning Christ as the Good Shepherd. This is actually, it was a pagan image of Dionysus. And you see the fish, which is strange for you to see that this fish means Jesus. And that's uh, symbolically because in Greek, the first letters of uh, fish is called Ichtis, and these first letters stand for Jesus Christos Theurios Soter. Uh, and then finally, with, the Constantine, with Constantine and the legalization of Christianity in the fourth century, sculptural works begin to appear on sarcophagi, for example. Um, so, there raises, of course, a very interesting question. What does this completely new God look like? This God of whom no one is supposed to make unto himself a likeness. Christianity, unlike Judaism, has at its disposal the image of Christ, by means of which it can now represent the divine. Christ is God incarnate. Christ, in other words, of Paul, is God's image. In Greek theology, the sun is seen as an icon, so kind of an emblem of the Father. You see, uh, we have then also in Corinthian uh, miniatures, God just showing with a hand. You see, this is God giving the commandments to Moses, and on the right edge you see the hand of God. God. So you don't see God, but just a hand. Um, but now in the fourth century, you have all kinds of images, and I show you some of them. You see here uh, Christ, and if you would know, you, I think you would not recognize him as Christ. You would think he is perhaps a Greek uh, philosopher. Or you have uh, Christ as a ruler like Zeus. And now at the end of the fourth century, under the rule of Emperor Theodosius, Christianity 
is declare the official religion of the state. And slowly but surely you have a complete conflation of Christ and the likeness of an emperor. So here you have Christ. <clears throat> you wouldn't think actually that this is Christ, yeah? Because it's really, it's coming from the art of antiquity, but loaded with a completely new meaning. And here, uh, with, uh, here you see again uh, Christ as a ruler, and this is now the time of Theodosius at the end of the fourth century. And now you see, here you see Theodosius, and you see how similar it is. Christ looks like a profane emperor. You see here Ravenna, uh, you see again uh, in the 6th century Christ uh, as a ruler of the world, and even Christ as a soldier, looking like a Roman soldier. So very different images, and for us uh, strange, because we, we are normally not used to this kind of images of Christian or Jesus. Now from the 6th century on, so-called genuine images begin to make their appearance. And this is especially in Byzantium, in Constantinople, in the eastern part, uh, you have images which are called a hieropoeton. Images sought not to be made by man, not being made by humankind, but are authentic images of God. And the first we have is this very, very important and very famous icon, uh, Sinai icon, uh, where uh, this is about, uh, about uh, 600 the beginning of the 7th uh, century. And, um, and here, you, now you start recognizing Christ as you are used to, to see pictures of Christ. Um, he, this Sinai icon uh, combines uh, the likeness of uh, an emperor but also with really divine uh, aspects, with authorities, but yet a sensuous presence. It is beauty, elegance, and yet sunken cheeks, slightly asymmetrical eyes. There is, it's impossible of looking the painted figure in the eyes. And Christ is holding a book in one hand, and the other hand making the gesture of benediction. Now, now we have, especially in Byzantium, we have the questions raised to the authenticity of divine images. And some uh, said these are, this is an authentic image, but also says you are, you are not allowed to make an image of God. So what happened in Byzantium was iconoclasm. That means that all images were forbidden, and this is part of the 8th till the middle of the 9th um, century. To this day, there is a lack of clarity as to the extent and causes of iconoclasm. Since all the so-called iconoclast sources were destroyed by the iconodules, by the ones who actually then uh, had the victory and we had images again. And you have always to, to recognize when it comes to writing of history, it is important to keep a fact in mind, namely history is always written by the victorious. During the iconoclast period, the only sign used by the Eastern Church was the cross. Following iconoclasm, the, the problem regarding the authenticity of images of Christ. And images said not to have been produced by human hands, the Aeroboeta, now start making their appearance. You have now different images, all said that they were not made by hand, 
and you see them how they look here. Um, so this was a belief that one can use this as an image because it was not made by by a human um, by a human being. And um, we we see then in Byzantium in eastern part uh, in the eastern part that this uh, this idea of Jesus God stays and for centuries yeah you have all they reproduce this for centuries and it stays always the same you know this here for instance um, much later and it is always the same uh, God. Jesus, God, as a Pantocrator, as a, a ruler. Um, in the early Middle Ages, the paths along which East and West uh, have evolved diverged. So this is what happened in Byzantium. But in the West, something different happened. Uh, in the West, a different concept of how images should be understood. And it is diversity. Different, you have different media, you have book illumination, mural painting, rather than icons. Around the year 600, Pope Gregory I, this is Gregory the Great, stated that images are to serve as reminders, that they exist for the benefit of the illiterate, but that they should not be treated as objects of veneration. Here we see the difference between theology and popular piety, the latter of which is eventually adopted by the church itself and further cultivated. There were images that were said to be miraculous, and these images naturally were venerated. In the end, the church finds itself advocating just the opposite of what it initially professed as doctrine. You have still Nowadays, all kinds of uh, paintings, you know, where people think that they are miraculous. Um, but I show you now different, uh, different images of Christ in, in the Western part. And you see here the Carolingian examples, mostly useful without a beard. And, um, but also, but you have also got the creator, although identical with Christ figure. So you see here in the book illumination, you see the creation of Adam and Eve. And of course, this can't be Jesus because Jesus didn't exist. So it is God the Father. Um, in the West, in numerous synods and between the Carolingian rulers and Rome, there was a continued debate concerning the status of images. The Libri Carolini and subsequently other texts as well make reference to Pope Gregory I and the doctrine that images should not be venerated but should be preserved as reminders of the redemptive deeds of Christ. So here you have a <clears throat> Two book illuminations from the Othonian period that is tenth to the eleventh century, and here again you see you see on the one hand Christ in the mandola, but on the other hand you see the emperor, and you see how similar uh, this is again. Um, now in the West, two versions of the divine image dominate the visual arts. On the one hand, the enthroned Christ in majesty, the so-called majestas, uh, and you have it all over the place, in, in book illumination, on the churches, everywhere. But on the other hand, you have Christ on the cross. And you see here a late example of um, of uh, the divine as a, as a majestas, but here again at the Gentile Tapis by Jan van Eyck of the 15th century, it is actually God the Father, what, what you see. Um, so on the other hand, you have the cross. 
the cross is one of the first images of Christ, of the divine. And so you see, you have two very different images of God. It's on the one side, the divine as a ruler, the maestas looking like an emperor, the ruler of the world. But on the other side, you have the, the, you have the cross and the sacrificial victim. But what I show you here is just that you re and because I, I have not the time to you know to go into detail the differences between Christian religion and others, but just to show you one glimpse to show the difference of this uh, image of Christ hanging on the cross and the Buddha, uh, which you know shows this enormous difference of uh, meaning of what is divine. Um, But what is now very important is the first images of Christ on the cross are completely different than what happened afterwards in, in the high Middle Ages. You see here Christ on the cross, but he has open eyes and he is not hanging, but he is standing. This is a Christ completely different from the Christ that we know from later periods. And what it means is Christ is he who overcomes this. And you see other uh, examples here from the Carolingian period. Christ standing on the cross, open eyes, not hanging. He is the one who overcomes this. Or again here in this miniature, Christ even had a looking at the people coming. So and now the first example we know where this changed is the so-called Gero Cross dated about uh, uh, 975, late 10th century. So as you can see, an, iconogra an iconographic change signifies a semantic shift, a change in the meaning to be conveyed. Because first it is Christ overcoming death, but here it is Christ uh, suffering. In Italy, you have Christ uh, with open eyes on the Croce di Pinta till the 13th century, so very long. It took quite a time that, you know, that this change really changed. So uh, what I show you here is how uh, then, um, and with Marco Aldo in the 13th century, uh, Christ on the cross is uh, look, looking like, and then we have this, of course, everywhere. Yeah, we, we have this, uh, this, this image of, of uh, the crucifix with Christ uh, is ubiquitous. And you, we see it here with Aurora van der Leyen or with Grunewald. Grunewald in the, 13th, in the 16th century, now with the beginning of the Reformation and with the Peasants' War in Germany, you have really Christ suffering extremely. Yeah, it's not, there's nothing to be seen that Christ overcame this. It's a completely different image, but then with the Counter-Reformation, it changed again. You see here a Greco and the Rubens, you have again Christ with open eyes and already looking like a resurrection. Or uh, Juan here hanging, but in uh, the, the artist, uh, Lucas, as an artist, painting Christ. But of course, God slash Christ also appears in narrative context, such as that of the creation of the world. So here it is clear that it is not Jesus, but it is God the Father. But they look so much the same that you, it is difficult to say, is this Christ? 
for God, but only the context says it has to be God the Father because it, although that would be impossible. Um, you see also here this very nice uh, miniature showing God constructing the world like an architect, or on the other side, Boccaccio, God as a child learning how to paint. And then we have uh, uh, the, the other way around, we have the, like here with Dürer, the identification of artists with God. So here I think you have to make a distinction between the subjective intention and the effect. The subjective intention by Dürer was for sure to identify with Christ, to show that he is a real pious, religious man, but for us it is it looks like Hebrews, you know, to show oneself as Christ. And of course this is a conception that will continue that artists somehow believe that they are divine creators. But of course you have now narrative scenes like the Annunciation or like Baptism of Christ where you have God the Father. But as you see in the West, there exists a variety of divine images. The notion of an archaeopoeton played a minor role in the West. It wasn't until the 13th century that the legion of Saint Veronica emerged. So you have this idea of an archaeopoeton, you have it in the West, but it, it plays a minor role, and it is the legion of Saint Veronica, and that comes from the Greek Vera Icon, or Vera Icon. Vera is uh, veritas, true, and icon is image. So the true image is Vera Icon, Vera Icon, Veronica, and the legend is that Veronica uh, um, held her handkerchief to Christ's face, the sudarium, and then she had on her handkerchief, on the sudarium, she had the, the image of Christ. Like here, this is the holy Veronica with this uh, sudarium. And uh, this idea uh, played a major role also in other times. Here you see with the Suavaran. Um, here we see how the Sudarium raises theoretical questions concerning the very nature of what one calls an image. Not only the question as to whether or not a genuine likeness of God exists, but also the question just what is an image? Is an image an imprint, a true likeness? It is, is it mimesis? Or rather, is painting an illusion? Suvaran so paints a trompe l'oeil that creates a double illusion. We have the impression that we are looking at a piece of cloth, a textile object, and on this piece of cloth, we see what seems to be an imprint of Christ's face, an imprint that does not seem to have been produced by any human hand. And this question uh, goes into the 20th century, as you can see here, uh, by an artist, uh, Wolz, who calls this Sudarium of Veronica. Perhaps you've noticed uh, here that God most of the time resembles Jesus. It wasn't until the 12th century that a distinction began to be made between God the Father and God the Son of God and the Son of God. Unlike Christ, God is seen as an elderly man. And then during the Renaissance, God the Father is rather consistently depicted as an old man with a beard. So I show you, for example, but of course you know many of those. Here it's clear this is God the Father and it's not Jesus, and he looks like an old man. <clears throat> Pictorial works in which God the Father 
the Son of God and the Holy Spirit are shown simultaneously as the Trinity. Here you have a very early uh, example of the Trinity of the 13th century, where it's very difficult, again, to say, is this God the Father and the Son? And of course, the Dove is the, um, the Holy Spirit. But then afterwards, there is a clear uh, distinction between the Son and the, the Father here with um, Master of Le Mal, a Netherlandish painter of the 15th century, and uh, people of uh, Rubens. Uh, Tertullian introduces the notion of Trinitas, Trinity in the 4th century. The Trinity of God becomes an official doctrine. God in three hypostases. In other words, God existing as three simultaneous levels of being. For a long time and in numerous synods, this doctrine was a subject of dispute. Because some said, it's, there is only one God, and Jesus is his son. And others said, God is the, de the, the, the deity has kind of three parts. Um, so that was a long debate for centuries. In Judaism, the Holy Spirit was merely the Ruach HaKodesh, the divine breeze, but not the deity. In Judaism, the notion of God's divine breath, God's energy, being able to take possession of a human being. The notion of a triune God has several roots, as can be seen from images of gods from the ancient Orient, those of uh, Isis and Osiris, for instance, with the child Horus. But in other religions, the model is that of father, mother, and child. One could also see this as a certain emendation of Judaism's radical monotheism. A special form of representation of the Holy Trinity was the throne of mercy. I'll show you this here. For all the differences that can be seen from early Christianity through the Middle Ages and up to the present day, one aspect remains constant, even in Judaism, and then in Protestantism, which, as we all know, rejected in its turn the practice of producing images of God. Namely, God is masculine. In Judaism, it's Adonai, my Lord. In Christianity, all three terms, that is God, the Father, God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are masculine. In the Middle Ages, however, there existed sculptural works that were at variance with this established patriarchal conception. Here you see a figure of Mary with her infant Jesus on her knee, one of the most common types of representation in medieval art. What is special about this sculptural form, however, is that it can be opened like a triptych, allowing the viewer to see inside the body of the Mother of God, as it were. Lo and behold, what do we see inside this body of the Virgin Mary? We see the Holy Trinity. God the Father, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We know of the existence of shrine madonnas, they are called shrine madonnas, from the 13th to the 17th century. Only about 65 actual works have survived. 
the rest being known to us exclusively from written records. Given their distribution, we can conclude that many more must have existed. This type of representation possibly originated in Spain and not as previously assumed in France. In the beginning, what were seen inside the figure were predominantly narrative scenes having to do either with the life of Mary or the Passion. But the 13th century saw the emergence of a type characterized by the presence of the Trinity, and this eventually became the preferred motive. It wasn't until the late Middle Ages that the Trinity type was combined with that of the Madonna with the shelter and cloak, also known as the Madonna of Mercy. One of the most admirable examples of this is found in Vienna's Cathedral Museum. We have it here in Vienna in the Dom Museum. Unfortunately, neither the Christ child nor the crucifixion nor the dove has been preserved. The gently flowing folds of Mary's cloak and the treatment of her facial traits indicate that this figure belongs to the so-called soft or international style and dates from approximately uh, 1420. The larger shrine Madonnas were undoubtedly displayed on the altar, whereas the smaller ones were reserved for private prayer. The increase in popularity of the shrine Madonnas must be considered in the context of the veneration of Mary in the period dating from the 12th to the 15th century. The reasons for this upsurge in her popularity are complex. In the context that presently interests us, however, let it suffice to point out that this veneration of Mary in no way corresponded to a harmonious social consensus. On the contrary, the diverse social classes, the nobility, the royalty, the nation, urban classes, as well as religious groups, including the official church, various orders, heretical movements, and mystical currents, all loaded the figure of Mary with meanings that were quite divergent. The power attached to this figure created serious theological problems for the church. Problems regarding the Virgin Mary's excess of competence, her place within the hierarchies established by the church, her human and yet divine nature, and the problem posed by the paradox of virginity combined with motherhood. In medieval legions, poetry and hymns, Mary becomes an ideal femininity possessing all imaginable positive qualities as totally contradictory as some of these may be. Absolute purity, chastity, and humility on the one hand, and eroticizing beauty and motherly devotion on the other. On the one hand, the pauper's advocate, and on the other hand, the queen of heaven. <clears throat> In Marian poetry, she is extolled as being, among other things, the gates of paradise or the heavenly gates. Here the word porta, meaning door or gate, is always used as bearing a double connotation. The closed door symbolizing virginity, and the opening signifies not the physical aperture, but transcendence. However, in the case of the Shrine Madonna, the Virgin, the Vierge Ouvrante, as we call them, this virginal body is open materiality, that is, materially. The opening and closing mechanism is similar to that of a retable. But here, the material medium involved is not a neutral wooden panel. 
It is the body of the Virgin Mary itself. Thanks to the Virgin Mary, or rather, thanks to this act of opening the Virgin Mary's body, God the invisible becomes visible. In this manner, we actually see the process of incarnation take place as it were. The acts of opening and closing are evocative of secrecy and disclosure. The cult character is heightened by the very ritual of opening. Indeed, the shrine madonnas were opened only on specific holidays or in exceptional circumstances that were perceived as threatening. Designing the inside of the left and right panels or wings as the inside of the cloak of the Madonna of Mercy was an ingenious idea. The act of opening these wings was perceived by the faithful as being that of opening the Virgin Mary's cloak. And as this cloak was being opened, they felt themselves being drawn into this shelter, into Mary's protection. Indeed, they were able to imagine that this was a wondrous act on the part of the Virgin Mary herself. Medieval legions tell of the Virgin Mary's readiness to help. They tell of her power to intervene and plead for mercy, even against the will of God, even against what was held to be the law. Mary's function had always been that of a mediator, an intercessor and intermediary, intermediary between mortal man and God. The Madonna of Mercy, with her sheltering cloak, was the representation by excellence of this hope for divine mercy. In remarkable fashion, the Shrine Madonna incorporates Mary's function as a medium of communication in all its aspects, in that it conveys a notion of both an inner or earthly and an outer or sacred transcendental world. It symbolically accomplishes the act of incarnation, and it brings those who seek protection into direct contact with the Holy Trinity, which is seen as contained within her. The conception of the Holy Trinity is a central element of the Christian faith, because it is a doctrine that, to quote a known formulation, reveals the ultimate act essence of what God himself is. In the research, reference has often been made to medieval Latin and German hymns that sing the praise of the Virgin Mary, hymns in which she is called the Templum Trinitatis or the Shrine of the Holy Trinity. In poetry that concerned itself with the adoration of the Virgin Mary, she was commonly characterized as the house of the Holy Trinity. Nevertheless, critical positions were taken against the Shrine Madonna, some of them by quite influential individuals. Jean Gerson, for example. In his Christmas sermon of 1402, Gerson, who was an eminent scholastic and chancellor of the University of Paris, condemned the Shrine Madonna because, in his words, there is neither beauty nor devotion in that act of opening up such a sculptural work, and it, would, it could become the source of error or impiety. In the year 1570, this criticism voiced by Gerson was reproduced in Latin translation by Johannes Molanus, one of the most adamant proponents of image censorship within the context of the Council of Trent. Molanus wrote that upon seeing a shrine Madonna in the Flemish town of Diest, he had remembered the scholastic's admonitory words and had felt that they only confirmed his personal disapproval of the shrines. In 1745, in a papal brief, Pope Benedict XIV 
citing both Jason Molanos once and again, and definitely contained the Shrine Madonnas. It is sometimes maintained incorrectly that the Shrine Madonnas were forbidden. Prior to the Council of Trent, there exists no explicit prohibition of images in contrast to Byzantium. There existed no theoretical dogma concerning sacred images. What did exist were merely regulatory mandates concerning how sacred images were to be used, reference repeatedly being made to Pope Gregory I, who held not the sacred images should be destroyed, but that they should be not be venerated, although they were to be considered useful as a means of instruction for the purpose of nurturing piety, especially among the illiterate. <coughs> Up until the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, sacred images were evidently not considered to possess the power of heresy. Unlike the written or spoken word, <coughs> nevertheless, Gerson's criticism was, in my view, of enormous significance. What is also very telling as to the controversial nature of this form of representation is the fact that in the case of many of the Shrine Madonnas, either the entire throne of mercy or, as in the case of the Vienna Madonna, the crucifix and the dove alone have been removed. A further indication of the contentiousness surrounding the shrines is the fact that such a small number of them have survived. Reading art historians' interpretations of medieval works of art is often like reading a theological exegesis. One reads mystical and poetic works differently than normative the theological texts precisely in view of the fact that the Shrine Madonnas, which combine various pictorial traditions, evoke complex cross references and associations, it must be assumed that their reception was varied. Their wide distribution, the obvious diversity with regard to the persons or entities that commissioned these sculpted works, as well as the differences in the dimensions of the shrines that have survived, all support the thesis of a varied reception. An educated theologian will certainly have read the shrines differently than an illiterate layman, and a mystically inclined man differently than a Teutonic knight. But even in the case of a single individual, the combination of diverse iconographic elements enhanced by the convertible aspects of the sculpture could lead not only to reference and meditation, but also to efforts to interpret, to a process of independently becoming aware of many different associations and analogies. Although the Shrine Madonnas were widely distributed, they seem to have been of particular significance to nuns in convents, especially with the context of female mysticism. So, what was it then that Gerson found so irritating? He tells us himself, Mary contained with, within her only the Son of God, never the Trinity. What the Shrine Madonna shows vividly is in fact a scandal. Mary, the ideal image of womanness, seen as an overarching principle. Is this not a reminder of woman seen as a bearer of children? A reminder of all mystical conceptions of woman, the great mother goddess? 
The fact is the concept mother bear of children is consistent with the natural order of things. In one version of the Old Testament, however, this natural order was turned upside down by a means that had been reversed. I will come back to this in, another, in the next lecture. In version number two of the book of Genesis, we read that God created Eve from Adam's rib. During the entire Middle Ages and up to the early modern era, this narrative of an inverse birth, so to speak, served as a theological basis and legitimization of woman's subordination to man. Gerson's criticism was not targeting poetic verse that praised the Virgin Mary as a temple, house, or shrine of the Trinity. Indeed, in a sermon delivered on the occasion of the Feast of the Holy Trinity, he himself described Mary as a temple sacré de toute la benoite Trinité. His criticism was, in fact, aimed exclusively at the concrete visual depiction of this notion. In this connection, it is worth remembering that Bernard of Clairvaux, one of the most influential representatives of the Sendan order of the 12th century, used a language that was particularly rich of metaphors. And in so doing, he played a significant role in the development of myological mysticism and the distinctively pictorial mental imagery that went along with it. But at the same time, he rejected the concrete visual works of art. The discrepancy between metaphorical language on the one hand and on the other, hostility towards concrete images casts a light on the very relationship between language and image. In the Vienna Cathedral Museum catalogs for the years 1973 and 87, the visual composition inside the Vienna sculpture is interpreted as being an illustration of the words of a hymn composed by Adam of St. Victor. This conclusion is inadequate and in fact obscures the actual problem, namely that of the difference between language and image. Here we see highlighted the paradox of expressing a theological idea in the form of a concrete visual image. Indeed, there's a fundamental difference between using an image as a verbal metaphor on the one hand, and on the other, actually giving the image a material form. As pictorially vivid as a metaphor may be, it remains nevertheless abstract and leaves room for the mind to imagine the transcendental. Giving this verbal picture as a material form cements it, so to speak. When I read or hear that the Virgin Mary is the shrine of the Trinity, this remains conceptual and by the same token something that I cannot actually see. The painted sculpture, on the other hand, stands before me, a three-dimensional, space-consuming, chromatic, and therefore sensuous presence a corporeal presence that reveals a alita that is in real fashion the trinity located inside the Virgin Mary. Moreover, if one considers how myological devotion was perceived in the sacral context, one can imagine the strong reactions that this form of sculptural work was able to provoke. Pictures and sculptures were able to bring about different visions and mystical experiences than those, <clears throat> than those brought about by spoken or written words. 
It can be said in general that transcription from one medium to another, in case at hand from language to painted sculpture, brings about semantic change. Describing the Vierge of Rod merely as an illustration of something that had already been expressed in words divests her of her suggestive power. It seems perfectly conceivable that her sensuous presence gave rise to other forms of experience, that it triggered other visions and associations. In the case of the Vienna Shrine Madonna, Mary is presented as a woman deity, once again as a bearer of all. The lateral wings of the sculpture spread open in three-dimensional space like arms, draw the faithful in. They incorporate the faithful. The numerous figures seen seeking protection executed in relief serve as a link between the faithful and the Madonna. Mary literally embraces everything and everyone, the divine and all the faithful, including the faithful who stand before her. Thank you. We see each other in three weeks.